a winery may make their wine as good as a Grand Reserva, as aged and all those beautiful flavors, but call it a Crianza in order to get them to drink it more frequently. Rioja is the most important wine region in Spain. Uh, this has been the area that has seen the most commercial success. And right now, if you were to ask any wine lover, any collector, even just somebody who's heard of wine from Spain, you could say so many regions and many varietals. If you say Rioja, that'll be the one that they've heard of, at least heard of. And there's a really important reason um, with the history of its story as to why it's become so prevalent all over the world as being such an important part of, of Spanish wine. So a little bit about where Rioja is. It's in the northern part of Spain, and it is part of actually three different political zones. The main zone is La Rioja. So not only is Rioja a denomination of origin, but it's also a political zone, one of the 17 autonomous regions of Spain. There's two other regions, though, that the wine region of Rioja dips into. So besides being mostly within the political zone of Rioja, it also stretches over into Navarra on the east. And in the northern part, it touches up into the very bottom part of Pais Vasco, or what we know as the Basque country. And all of these different areas have a very strong influence on the terroir, uh, there's different soil types and everything. But the main pieces to understand is that there's mountains to the north and to the south and a giant river that runs through it. And Rioja is a valley of the Ebro River, which is the really one of the most uh, important rivers of Spain. There's quite a bit of agricultural pr production all along the Ebro River. Rioja sits in the center of northern Spain and it is sort of a convergence of climate zones. Um, it's spread between the Mediterranean climate from the east and the Atlantic climate from the west. And Rioja is sort of blessed with a climate that's very protected. Um, in the north, there's the Sierra de Cantabria's mountains, and then in the south is the Sierra de la Demanda. And they provide sort of an amphitheater effect that shelters Rioja on almost all sides from the elements. And outside of that, there's the Meseta, which is a much more extreme climate, um, really hot and very dry. And Rioja gets sort of blessed with temperatures that are much more mild and there's a little bit more rainfall. So this makes it sort of the perfect storm for easy, great vine growing conditions. Another big influence on Rioja's climate is the Ebro River. And the Ebro River flows through the area um, and sort of cuts it into three different subzones. Like Bordeaux, the Ebro River has uh, two banks that divide the subzones of Rioja Alta and Rioja Alavesa. And then the remaining subzone is to the south and to the east, and that's called Rioja Oriental or Rioja Baja. Rioja Alta is located on the western edge of the region, and this area has the highest elevations of Rioja wines. The soil type here is mostly calcareous, and it has a lot of clay to it. It um, also, this area has got the most elevation to it, and so the wines from Rioja Alta are known for producing wines that have a unique acidity to them, which makes them um, have a really long potential for aging. On the other bank of the Ebro River is Rioja Alavesa. And this is the left bank of the river, and it has a fairly similar climate to Rioja Alta and a similar soil type also calcareous, but there's a lot more clay here. Um, and because of the clay, and because of the fact that it's situated on the Ebro River, um, much of the vineyards are south facing here. And this produces wines that are more generous, that are more ripe and more rich. Um, it also gives wines a little bit more of that sort of like fruity ripeness um, that classifies the wines of Rioja Olivesa. Rioja Baja is the warmest, driest subzone. This area, because of the fact that it's got a different terroir that's 
that's unique, um, also is uh, known for its garnacha. This is um, also a different soil type than the other two regions. There's much more alluvial soils here, um, which is another reason why the garnacha does so well. About the history of Rioja, while it stretches back thousands of years, uh, wine has been growing here for a very long time. However, the real important part comes right in the 1800s. So during this time, Rioja was already producing wines. There was bodegas that were making mostly bulk wine, um, but they had good wine and already had a reputation for making good wine there. Um, mostly because that area is just really in an ideal zone for growing to be a bit easier compared to other parts of Spain where growing conditions are more extreme. Rioja has got this nice protection here from with the mountains on both the north and the south and the warmness of the river. So they were already making decent bulk wine, right? And they're selling it to not only for the region internally to drink, but maybe to some neighboring regions as well. So just supplying wines for the people at the time that needed wine to drink because it was safer to drink than water. The real producer of phenomenal wines in the world was France. And in the middle of the 1800s, phylloxera changed the wine world for the better. At the time, probably felt like for the worse, um, but ultimately it made a huge impact on the entire world because phylloxera came from the New World. So vines from America were brought from America over to France. And unlike what we'd be doing nowadays, that if you were to take a species of anything that was not natural to a certain area and plant it, you would quarantine it, you would test it, you would make sure that you were protecting it from having any weird infection on anything around it. But during this time, they weren't practicing that. So what they, what looked like perfectly healthy vines actually had a very invisible vine louse known as phylloxera in the roots. And phylloxera lives on the roots and completely kills the vines within a matter of years. So they planted these vines in France and it over years and in time, wiped out more than two thirds of Europe's vineyards, starting in the south of France and moving its way up. So by starting in the south of France, which France was already, you know, making amazing wines that were very well known, very high priced and traded all over the world. So Bordeaux being that main region um, of the southern part of France. And then when they got hit with phylloxera and lost the majority of their vineyards, those very important chateaux and wineries needed to find wine to resupply their stocks in order to keep selling wine, right? Until they figured out what to do with their vineyards. So they went to several regions, but a very, very big part of them stopped in Rioja. One, it was already producing wine. Two, it already had red varietals there, and that's what Bordeaux is mostly known for, and they needed more red wine, right? And also, three, it looks and feels a lot like Bordeaux in Rioja. You've got the river influence, you've got all that sedimentary soils that really allow for lots of variations within the vineyards. There's a lot of land there and a lot of grapes, so they came to Rioja, many of them actually ended up settling there so that they could build wineries or invest in the wineries that were already there and help those producers farm better, create barrels. In fact, this was a time in Spain where most wines were in barrel, but they were in really, really large barrels that were old um, and just think as, as big as possible. They introduced using exact size 225 liter, liter barrels. So they taught them how to not only make the barrels and season the wood, use this exact size and you'll get more precision in your wines by aging everything in this, in this smaller barrel and you'll get more influence from the oak. So they really brought their high quality winemaking techniques to Rioja and transformed what was just bulk wine into high quality wine and Spain had not been introduced this yet. So remember, we're talking the middle of the 1800s and 
most of Spain was producing either bulk or fortified wines. And the fortified wine production all really started and created in, in Jerez. So Spain was doing the same thing um, all over the Iberian Peninsula, those same types of wines. And here they were finally learning how to make high quality red wines. Uh, and they learned it in the Bordeaux method. So <clears throat> blending is the key to the recipe of Bordeaux. Not only blending different varietals, right? You can blend using the different characteristics of the different grapes that grow in that area and make sure that you're balancing with fruit, acidity, alcohol, tannin, all of that, but also blending from different vineyards. So they said, you know, you may have one vineyard that's hotter and better for getting all the fruitiness that you want in the wine, but this vineyard over here will offer you more structure because it's a little bit cooler and here you'll have more acidity. So depending on the type of wine you want to make, you'll know how to use a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then of course, as vintages change, you can change up that blend as well. So classic Rioja really follows that pattern of blending varietals, blending from different vineyards, different regions within Rioja, and using different barrel aging techniques. If it wasn't for this, I don't know that we would know Rioja in the way that we do now. It got a huge head start on all the other regions. Once phylloxera was solved, which was some decades later, France was able to solve for the issue. They replanted their vineyards with vines grafted to American rootstocks. So the American roots were resistant to the, to the disease. Slowly but surely, all of France was rebuilding their vineyards. And by the time phylloxera hit Spain, the solution was already, already known. So Spain was very lucky that when phylloxera did come through, they were able to plan ahead and, and say, okay, once this does kill all of our vineyards, we know how to, how to solve for it. But by then, France had essentially moved out of Rioja, uh, all other than the ones that stayed and settled and remained there to be now Rioja winemakers. Um, but Rioja was now known. It was known and it was going to continue to be sold and shipped all over the world um, because people wanted to drink wines from Rioja, this new, amazing uh, red wine producing region of Spain. Rioja has several um, classified grapes that are important to the region and even a few sort of non-classified grapes that are also important to the region that do connect to that historic story about Bordeaux coming and bringing all of their techniques. Um, they also brought their grapes. Uh, more on that in a moment. The main, main variety of Rioja is Tempranillo. Um, it is possible that Rioja is even the birthplace of the grape Tempranillo. Um, but this is the main flavor of all red Rioja. The other grapes that are important here for the red wines are Garnacha, Mazuelo, and Graciano. Garnacha is the second most important red varietal and it can produce much more um, dark red fruit flavors, a little more alcohol, sometimes a little bit more richness in color, although it's a bit more oxidative, um, similar to Tempranillo. Tempranillo gives cherry flavors, but as Tempranillo ages, it can give more spice and a lot more of those tertiary qualities. So the mushroom, the cigar, and the tobacco. Tempranillo really loves to age in oak and it, and it handles it really well. So Garnacha and Tempranillo are those two main grapes. Tempranillo is a bit of a shorter cycle grape. So it really exists in the majority of Rioja and then really pushes towards that Western side to the most, right? Um, so as it snuggles up to Castilla y Leon, Tempranillo is just more and more the more prevalent red varietal. But when you're in that part of Rioja that's closer to Navarra and actually in Navarra, um, this is where Garnacha does better. It's a little bit lower land, 
um, but the summers are much longer and garnacha is a longer cycle grape. So it can handle those much longer growing seasons a little bit better than Tempranillo. So it does really well in the subregion Rioja Oriental. The other two varieties, Graciano and Mazuelo, are also really phenomenal grapes for um, supporting the blends of Rioja. It's really rare to find a wine that is 100% or even predominant of either one of those grapes. Um, and it's really just because the, those vines are being replaced often with more Tempranillo as Tempranillo has hit a level of world fame and that's the flavor and the varietal that people are in the most demand of. They're also a little harder to grow. Graciano is a longer cycle grape. So it is one of the last ones that's picked which for farmers there, that can be a bit risky because if your varietal is not fully ripened, you are risking that first fall frost to come and ruin your vineyards. In fact, there is a, there is a folklore that the name Graciano is actually from someone saying it, naming it, uh, Gracia, no, as in no thank you. I don't want that or I don't want to grow that. Um, which I think is a really cute story and perhaps it's true. Um, but it is a longer cycle grape, but I will say what Graciano can do is it adds spice and florality um, in ways that are just different than what uh, Garnacha and Tempranillo can add. And then Mazuelo adds strength. It's known to have good tannin and really good color and structure. So when you're making a wine that's gonna be a very, very long aged wine, particularly those Grand Reservas, Having some, even if one or two percent is all you can add, having that one or two percent of Mazuelo can really help with just the fortification of the wine and give it that nice long ageability. Then, of course, there's the white varietals. Those are the red grapes, and Rio has mostly a red wine producing area, but they also produce white wines, rose wines, and even a little bit of cava. There are some French red varieties that are sort of secretly allowed, um, and that's Cabernet and Merlot. So Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are both the main wines, or pardon me, main varietals of Bordeaux. And as you learned, Bordeaux had a huge influence on the region of Rioja. So when they came in the 1850s and started to settle and buy and grow and plant, they planted some of their own grapes. They had no idea if they would ever recuperate their own vineyards. But what they did know is they wanted to produce Bordeaux somewhere. So in order to really capture that Bordeaux flavor profile, they couldn't just use these red grapes that were there that they had no experience with. Tempranillo, Garnacha, Graciano, Mazuelo, and who knows how many other indigenous varieties could have been there before Phylloxera, right? So they planted Cabernet and Merlot. Um, Nowadays, if you were a winery that has old plantings of Cabernet and Merlot and you were a winery that was established before the DO was established, you are still allowed to use those vineyards. Um, however, you are not allowed to use it in your marketing materials. So you can't say on the blend of your wine that you've got any percentage of Cabernet or Merlot. You would just call them other varieties, or as they would say, otros, right? So there's several uh, very important wineries in Rioja that Cabernet and Merlot play a really star role in their blends, but they would never tell you that. Um, they only allow to really uh, promote the use of Tempranillo, Garnacha, Graciano, and Mezuelo. Rioja really sets the standard for long aging wines. And they really value that um, the aging methods and styles and length of time to a great degree. Um, in fact, most other wine regions of Spain do sort of follow the same pattern, which is known as the Crianza Reserva, Gran Reserva um, aging classifications. But Rioja really holds on to it as very signature for their style, where it's a little bit more optional. Um, in its use in the other wine regions of Spain, um, even the ones that are really Tempranillo-based as well. Rioja really um, is the main place that you'll still see 
those notations on their wines. And that's actually how their wines are classified. So there's four main classifications. The first one, which is um, a green sticker that's on the back, is just Rioja. So it has changed over time. It used to be called Hoven. It's been called Cosecha. But really now it's just known as your base level Rioja. These are one of two types of wines. It's either just the young wines of Rioja, and that's the majority of what falls into that classification level. So it means there's zero to minimum amounts of aging, uh, whether it's in the barrel or in the bottle. And these are just, imagine your youngest, fruitiest, easiest to drink, closest to their birth date wines. Um, and actually within Spain, these are the most popular kinds because they're high acid, they're very fruity and young and primary, and the people of Rioja really like drinking sort of like small quantities. We, we like to know of them as wine tapas, honestly, uh, of this type of wine, and it really goes well with anything that they're eating. And um, uh, Rioja is one of those uh, areas that loves to have people roaming around and uh, getting bites of food in between various bars and they get those bites of food of whatever that bar is known for and they'll get a cosecha or a rioja or a hoven of either white, red or rosé to go along with it. Throw it back and that's, that's drinking in rioja. So the next level up is crianza. Um, this is when you start to introduce some aging into the wine and it needs to be at least one year in the barrel um, and then at least one year in the bottle in order for a wine to be classified as a Crianza. I'm saying over and over, at least, right? This is the minimum requirement. So if you're going to be a Crianza, only one year is necessary in the barrel and only one year is necessary in the bottle, but you can definitely go beyond that in order to call your wine a Crianza, right? So this is actually one of the most popular styles of Rioja that's drank in the United States. We love that little bit of oak aging and how that uh, affects the spiciness, even the oxidation and the richness of the wine. Um, this is a lot of what is produced in Rioja as well, is that Crianza level. So it's still in many ways considered young wine on Spanish terms, but in the United States, it's kind of aged wine once you've already hit that two years after the vintage mark, right? Then the next level is Reserva. This is very similar to Crianza. It requires at least a year in barrel, but it needs an additional year in bottle than what the Crianza needs. So that little bit more time of resting with the microoxygenation inside the bottle. So one year in barrel, minimum, two years in bottle, minimum in order for a wine to be Reserva. Once wines start to get into the Reserva level, these are the levels where the wineries produce quite a bit less than what they're producing of their Crianza and their Rioja level wines. I might use the word Cosecha instead of using Rioja just to make it less confusing as I'm talking about these different classifications. So Reserva needs to be made from vineyards that can handle making longer aged wines. So sometimes even three years past the vintage can be too long for a wine to be resting in barrel and bottle before it's consumed. That can actually really deteriorate a wine. So only the best vineyards can be used for that. And then further on in the last category is Gran Reserva, which is two years in barrel and three years in bottle. So a minimum of five years from its vintage before the wine is sold. The Grand Reserves are the smallest amount of wines that are made, but they are considered the pinnacle style, the most aging. So important to understand that these are only minimum requirements on these different levels. And the most classic wineries usually go well above and beyond those minimums. The classic wineries to know of Rioja that do this uh, most famously Lopez de Heredia and all the wines of Lopez de Heredia um, whether it's their Tondonia vineyard, Gravonia, Veronia, and so forth, uh, these are generally well beyond the minimum requirements of aging, uh, including for their whites and their rosés as well, uh, which is outstanding. When you get these wines, you get these incredibly long aged wines. Other important wineries that do this that are of the classic style, La Rio Alta 
is another one that's very well known and makes beautiful uh, long aged wines. Um, and their reservas are always could be grand reservas. It's it's just what they're known for. Um, let's see another one. Cune is another um, very important one of the oldest uh, bodegas as well in the area that makes. Um, they do a, a pretty bigger range of wines that truly are that young cosecha style that they're actually really famous for. Um, most famous, a wine style called Monopole um, that they, they invented un oak aged white wine essentially for Rioja by making that line of wine, which is really cool. Nowadays, it's hard to think of it as a modern wine because it's been around for so long, but it, it truly is for Rioja modern wine. But then they've got many other wines that they make of the very long aging style in the classic way. However, important to know that the producers of Rioja do not actually have to follow this aging classification. They can skip it entirely. And the more modern producers are the ones that usually do skip it. And their reasoning for that is they don't want to be bucketed or pigeonholed into being a certain way, a certain style, or they don't want their wine to only be for a certain occasion. So they may avoid using the words Crianza Reserva and Grand Reserva. If they do that, and they can still use all that aging, lots of oak barrels, lots of time in bottle, but if they choose not to classify it, it'll go right into the Rioja classification. So it gets that same green label that all of the young Hoven Cosecha style wines will get. And that's really because there's just not an extra category for being extra special, right? So that's, that's really how the, the aging classification works. Um, what I'm often asked is why does any winery age beyond the minimum? So why make a wine a Crianza but age it like a Grand Reserva in the case of the Lopez Fioretti wines? Why do that? Why not call it a Grand Reserva? What you have to understand is the way Spanish people drink and treat wine. Wine is a part of all day, everyday life for them. This is a relatively new thing in the United States. We're new to wine and it's, it's, it's not a, a thing that's ingrained in every single family's history and table, both for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, but in Spain, it truly is. So they know what wines they're going to drink at what time of day, at what occasion, you know, for, for every single thing. So if you are a family that's from Northern Spain, you would have, as I was explaining to you, the cosecha wine any time of the day. If you're out having tapas, drink with friends, just catching up on politics, whatever it might be, that's what you're gonna drink. The easy and expensive young cosecha wine. Crianza is with, maybe it's a Friday night, right? And you want something a little bit better than what you've been drinking all week. Maybe it's a little cold. Maybe you're gonna have a pork roast. Like Crianza is a bit more special but it is something that you're gonna drink frequently. Reserva, now this is where you're getting into that type of wine where a, a Rioja family may only open a bottle of Reserva for a really special occasion. Maybe someone graduated, maybe someone is getting married, maybe who knows what they might celebrate, but Reservas are really for a special moment and Grand Reserva is for the most special moment. And in fact, maybe those are gifts for the birth of a child or something like that versus even drinking it for a special moment. It might be something that you give away to somebody. So with that in mind, a winery may make their wine as good as a Grand Reserva, as aged and all those beautiful flavors, but call it a Crianza in order to get them to drink it more frequently. So that is really how that ends up happening um, for those wines. And then the modern producers go away from it entirely, knowing that they don't want their wines to be in any way treated for any particular moment for drinking. They just want those wines to be loved at any point and for what they are and not squared away by this is how much oak you should expect from it and how much bottle aging you should expect from it. So it's a pretty fascinating part of the Rioja winemaking um, history. Um, I will say this though, it is, one of the only regions in the world that ages their wines before they sell it. This is 
pretty unique. If you think of all the other areas that sell wines that should be aged, Burgundy, Bordeaux, Napa, Sonoma, like so many regions make wines that you know as a collector, you really shouldn't open those bottles um, as soon as you get them. We do it anyways, because that's the reason why we buy them, we want to drink them, but we're drinking them too young. They have so much potential to age and age and develop and soften and become more, more magical, honestly, if you just let them rest. Rioja takes that work away from the consumer. So the bodegas tend to be very large and they have big cellars underground for aging and resting all of these wines, but they do all that there and they take on not only the work, but the expense of it. And then they finally sell those wines into the market and we get them for honestly the most affordable prices if you think about the age and the care that's been put into those wines. So it's one of the few wine regions in the world that you would ever see this happening, not even in just like a small level, in such a grand level. And now for the tasting. Okay. So I recommend pouring only two or three ounces of wine in the glass. That way you can have all this space for oxygen in the glass. That's going to help the aromas to come out. Um, I know you want to pour way more than that, but you can get to that after you've evaluated the wine. So let's just start with this, this nice small amount. So I've poured for myself a very, very well-known Crianza. Um, and this is something that's going to be a, a very good example of what Crianza wine should be like um, in Rioja. So the first thing you want to do is check out the color. So the wine that I have is predominantly Tempranillo, if not 100% Tempranillo. So I'm really looking at that typical couple years after the vintage color profile of a Crianza Reserva, sorry, a Crianza Rioja. So it's really got this sort of cherry color to it, um, a bit rosy here on the rim. And what I mean is I'm looking into it this way. Don't do this. This will not help you. You just don't see anything in that way. Try to hold it at about a 45 degree angle, more or less, over something white so that you can really get a sense of the color. And I'm looking at the right in the middle, how that's where you're going to get the deepest of the color. And then as it spreads out to the rim, um, you'll see how that color changes. Wines that are very dense um, or very extracted tend to hold that dark color all the way out to the rim. This one does not. And that is typical of Rioja. Not only just Crianza, but just Rioja. Rioja wines are rarely high in alcohol, especially if they're from uh, the more, if they're mostly from the Rioja Alta subregion. That's where you're going to get more of the 13%, 13.5% as your average alcohol range. And they're just not heavily extracted. So here I'm seeing that it's, it's, it's really kind of a nice color change and it's a bit more of a rosy color. Um, although I don't see any orange or brown here. So I'm seeing something that's a Crianza, which is a younger wine. If you have a Reserva or a Grand Reserva, you should see potentially, depending on how good the vintage is or how old the wine is that you have, a bit more brown. You might see something that's brick and if you've got a really old wine, a really tawny color to it. Um, so that is really that sign of age. As wines age, their bright primary aromas and their bright primary colors all drop out. That is just what oxygen does to the wines. So reservas, Grand Reservas expect a little bit more orange to brown and tawny colors here. But if you've got a Cosecha or a Crianza like me, you should be seeing more pink, fuchsia, rose petal-y colors to it, right? Okay. Again, it depends on that vintage. I really have to say that because if you pulled a Crianza that was from um, Lopez de Heredia, for example, well, you still, you may have a 10 year old wine. So in that case, you've got a Crianza that's more like a Grand Reserva um, and you would see more um, brown in the color or orange. Okay, so we got the color nailed down. Time for the aroma. So with Tempranillo being the main contributor to the aromas here, particularly at this age, and I have a Crianza, which is a bit younger, I've got a nice mix of spice and fruit. Those are my two things that are just jumping out at me immediately. The fruitiness is 
cherry layered with more cherries of all the cherry varieties. So black cherries, red cherries. This one is sort of in between a fresh and then kind of leaning in towards almost like a cherry um, compote or jam as well. So here we got a wine that's just got a little bit of aging to it. I'm even finding just a touch of orange citrus, almost like a marmalade kind of mixed in here as well. The wine that I have is from a more traditional winery, which means that they're using American oak here rather than French oak. The more modern producers are using French oak barrels now, but classically in Rioja, American oak is the oak that is used. And American oak lends a bit more of an oak power to the wine, more coconut, more almost more sweet oak um, aromas. So I'm really getting that here. And it almost smells tropical, honestly. I will say though, I'm not gonna call this wine oaky. Um, and again, only one year is required of making a Crianza. And my guess is they didn't probably go much more than that because on the nose, I'm really getting all of those aromas from the varietals itself. I'm getting more grapiness, more fruitiness, some floral notes. Um, and the oak, however much oak was used here, it's, it's very well integrated to the part where I, I wouldn't call this wine a very oaky wine. more power on that wine than I anticipated having. I'm gonna go ahead for a second taste. This was my first sip of wine. So that first sip is often, especially after all this talking, can be a little bit jarring on the palate because if there's acidity, there's tannin. Um, so I'm gonna have primed my palate just a little bit there and I'm gonna go for my second taste. Okay. So that is textbook Crianza. It tastes very much like it smells, although I'm getting more freshness on the palate. So the nose, I was smelling more of that marmalade and a bit more of the jamminess. On the palate, I'm getting like freshly crushed cherries. Um, the spice is really showing up as well. So getting just a touch of cedar, but like just a little bit of tobacco, um, just a little bit of leather, but it's really lots and lots of fresh cherry fruit also some strawberry is really showing it's um, showing itself through here um, and there's a lot of structure on here if your wine has a, gave you a little bit of a gush right like like my wine did that's the acidity here and acidity is just the beating heart of a young wine so as wines age that acidity will get mellower and lighter and kind of kind of softer this wine being a Crianza, not a very old wine, um, and the vintage I have is a 2016, so it's still got quite a bit of youthfulness to it. It tastes very much like fresh wine, um, which is a great sign because that tells me that with this bottle, I could actually hold on to it for probably several more years and it will still continue to have good life, good flavor to it, and it will only just evolve because I'm getting all primary flavors on the palate here. There was some tannin here, but they were like just soft kind of velvety um, and, and in no way crunchy. Like I, I didn't have to work hard to have the tannin um, soften out. It just kind of touched my teeth and then quickly went away. If I had cheese, if I had almonds, if I had some jamon or anything like that, I would probably would not even notice those tannins because the fat that would have been in any of those foods would just completely wipe it away. Um, but to me, this is a good medium bodied wine, fruity, has enough spice, has enough body and lift to it to, to make it a semi serious wine, just semi serious. It's, it's better than, than drinking something just completely inexpensive with no aging. And, um, like this, this is something that I would have, um, when I wanted to impress people and not spend that much money. <laughs> I mean, that's really what Crianza can be. It can be one of those wines that, that people will drink and taste and go, oh, wow, I really like this, and then not think any more about it. Um, you don't have to, um, you don't have to think too hard uh, about it, but you can really easily enjoy a wine like this. Anybody would like this.